So the next talk we're going to uh, um, present is the antenna-based calibration. This is your most basic calibration. It's going to be your first step. Um, and uh, um, I think it's very important that we at least understand this calibration um, technique. So at this stage, we've gone through, we understand our data, we have uh, flagged our data, and we have remo uh, removed most, if not all, of the bad data that we have um, in our observation. And now we're ready to start processing our data. So first, we would like to calculate our calibration solutions and uh, um, then apply our calibration solution to our target so that we can, can image. So as we saw this morning from Ben's um, very nice visibility um, lectures, is that um, from the interferometer, what we measure is the complex visibilities of the source. And the basic need for calibration is thus to correct these measured visibilities, here we will call them V of UV, okay? And what we would try to do, uh, to do is to approximate very closely our actual true visibilities, X of UV, through our calibration. Um, now, consequently, calibration is an important step in radio astronomy data. And um, you will actually see when you start planning your observations that you will actually dedicate time during an observation to look at calibrator sources and these must be included in your preparation and planning because if you do not include these calibration, so, uh, calibration targets you may not be able to calibrate your observational data properly and then you cannot meet your science goal. Uh, so to give you some idea of the calibrator sources um, we touched on that quickly during the flagging. The best calibrator sources are generally well known and usually unresolved and point-like, but it is not a requirement. And we utilize the well-known characteristics as well as the signal properties of these calibrator sources to, to measure and remove the effects of um, any residual um, phases due to instrument and atmosphere um, from our observed data and also known fluxes from these calibrators to, to actually get us a, a scale relation so we can align the uh, well arbitrary correlator values that we get out of our visibilities with the fluxes um, of the sources that we measure on the sky. Now various calibrator solutions exist but the most common we will touch on repeatedly um, in this presentation is gain and fa or phase calibration. Um, that requires a point like, although not a, def, uh, not a definite point source, but a point like uh, calibrator target. Um, band pass calibrator, which re do require a strong calibrator source, and it does also requ uh, require it to have a known spectrum. As well as flux calibration, which obviously requires us to have a known flux for that calibrator target. Um, so, essentially we are going to deal with an optimization strategy to correct the measured vis vis visibilities, to get to our true vis uh, visibilities. Um, and the main purpose for this is to remove, insofar as possible, the, all the effects um, that is added by our instrumentation, um, atmosphere, and in interstellar medium. Uh, so, in this presentation, I will follow the layout of starting with um, recapping the concepts of interferometry uh, to explain or try to explain the purpose of calibration after which um, you will see the basics um, of radio astronomy calibration, the concepts and procedures that we follow. And I will close that off with just some practical examples to demonstrate the basic methodology when we are calibrating our data. Um, so starting off with um, our recap, as we saw yesterday, it all, it all starts with our desperate hunt for angular resolution. Um, the resolving power of a telescope, as we remember, is our ability to separate objects that are located close together or on a small angular at a small angular distance. Um, thus, our angular resolution describes the ability of our radio telescope to distinguish small detail in the larger structure. 
but it is limited by the size of our interference fringes, as Ben pointed out this morning. The physical size of a single telescope does limit our spatial resolution, um, but our need for higher resolution has driven us uh, to extend this limit of single, single telescopes um, to interferometry, which is a technical problem for us to solve, but it does address um, the need for higher resolution, so we can observe this vast range of astrophysical phenomena that we wish to detect. And in its most basic form, we've also seen that interferometry basically involves the simultaneous projection of all the signals of a number of single telescopes onto the same image plane, as if all the telescopes were actually part of one big huge telescope. And if this is done in such a way that all the signals from each one of the telescopes arrives at the image plane exactly at the same time, these beams from all the locations can be combined through Fourier techniques to produce a single synthesized beam that is much smaller in angular resolution than any single beam of any single um, antenna or telescope. So on the correlator side thus, if we employ our interferometry, um, the, the meerkat interferometer measures correlator output um, from each pair of single dish its baseline of antennas to produce a series of complex interference patterns um, of two slowly varying voltages. So we have two output voltages from each one of our antennas which we combine to form interference patterns. And these interference patterns we call fringes. And they can be regarded as real and imaginary parts of a set of measurements of the complex visibility function. Where the complex visibility function is simply the cross correlations measuring the coherence of the signals as a function of spacing between the pairs of antennas. So as we uh, accumulate more and more of these fringe patterns and we combine them electronically, um, we see that the fringe pattern becomes more concentrated. So from the broad envelope here, we have a very narrow envelope if we have four antennas. And this, then uh, this pattern then starts to, to resemble the point spread function or PSF of a single large telescope. And basically we obtain the synthesized beam representing the, uh, the larger telescope, PSF, um, and which uh, basically measures our Fourier transform, showing a flat aperture like diffraction pattern for a large aperture across the maximum baseline. So now that we have the signal, why the need for calibration? Why, what happens to our signal? Well, in the path between the source and ultimately our wonderful correlator, a number of intentional and spurious transformations actually occur, which means that the signal we measure, which ultimately will be this V value of ours, remember, are distorted. And it is distorted in a number of places. One through the interstellar medium, then entering through the atmosphere, and then lastly, through our electronics themselves, our instrument has effects on the signal, and all of which corrupt the signal of our target of interest. So in general, these distortions, we can describe them as rotations and translations that is applied to the signal components okay, as the signal travel along the line of sight towards the telescope. Um, and this relation that we use to describe the measured um, relation to the measured um, visibilities to the actual visibilities is actually a linear equation, which is good for us. It means that the um, introduced distortions can be described as parameters that basically represents a gain factor per antenna in the antenna pair, as well as an additive noise term. Um, which now this noise basically comes from the amplitude and the phase errors because they scatter the power across the image and that this results in a more noisy image. But, but both of these contributors, both the gain and the noise, has to be cali calibrated out in our interferometer measurements. And this is why we need calibration. So in practice, um, these gain solutions these individual antenna gain solutions, are obtained by measuring calibrated sources as frequently as possible. And then those, oops, sorry, 
Those are followed by some matrix calculations okay, that we use to determine the corrections um, through some form of linear interpolation between measurements. So if we just go a little bit deeper into, into the mathematical details um, of these uh, equations, oh sorry, of, of this calibration procedures, um, we see that for each of the interferometer measurement, for each of these measurements, we thus have to correct the measured visibilities in order to approximate the true visibilities. And we do that for every time measurement. Um, so we have to obtain one of these corrections, um, to, to, sorry, and to obtain every one of these corrections, um, it requires us continuously to solve this linear relationship per antenna for complex gain factors at any given time, as well as the additive noise factor that represents the scatter across the image. So these become a large number of equations to solve um, for a large number of times. Um, so we're going to simplify our notation. So just to introduce you to our Jones matrices. Uh, what we do is we fall back on the fact that each visibility uh, is simply the time average cross correlation product of the total field measured at any two antennas, P, let's say P and Q, so any two antennas of the array, uh, with a time delay applied um, between the measurements. And then these cross correlation products I can then stick into a matrix, a form of matrix notation. Uh, and if I just use visibility as a matrix, you can see that um, it is the notation that I'm using now becomes conveniently compact. Yes, it hides a lot of details, but conceptually it becomes compact and I can describe um, the impact and distortions um, in a fairly readable way. So this matrix notation we use throughout in our calibration equations and they basically um, define for us our per antenna Jones matrices. And these Jones matrices try to basically um, describe to us or summarize for us all the many effects um, that our signal experience as it propagates towards our correlator. And we combine uh, all the, the effects, all these various uh, matrices through multiplication, um, again, into a single Jones matrix uh, that can actually then describe the entire um, product per antenna. And ultimately, um, by using these kinds of definitions, um, we come to what we uh, commonly refer to as the radio interferometer measurement equation or RIME. Now, this equation is a fundamental equation um, in calibration, and it seeks to fully describe um, as the signal travel along its path, not only all the distortions, but also the anticipated sequence in which these distortions will actually be applied to the signal. So you see here is my measured um, visibilities. Here is the visibilities um, that I want to recreate, that my true visibility I want to approximate. And here is a set of all possible distortions that may potentially impact my measurement. So the radio, uh, full radio interferometer measurement equation consists of quite a number of matrices um, that describes this impact and the order of the distortions. Okay. But what you should note is the lettering that we use for these matrices. Um, quite often conform to a certain standard. It's a convention that we follow um, that allows us in our calibration packages to actually um, understand or describe the type of calibration. Uh, just as an example, the, the G matrix will stand for gain, the B matrix is band pass, D is commonly um, used for polarization leakage and F for Faraday rotation. Um, but let's go through them individually and just define all of, um, well, at least most of the important matrices in this equation. So first off is actually our Faraday rotation. 
So this is, remember we measure two orthogonal polarizations for our signal. But when one of my polarizations is delayed with respect to the other one, it causes a phase shift. And we call that the Faraday rotation. After that, moving um, to the telescope itself, we may experience some parallactic angle rotation. And this is caused by the orientation of the sky in the telescope field of view that rotates as the target position um, moves over time. So it mo uh, means when I follow the target, I actually see a rotation of my um, sky in my field of view. And we correct this through parallactic um, angle rotation. Now this is a theoretical exercise and generally this one we can actually calculate beforehand. Uh, another important matrix is my instrumental polarization, my D matrix. Um, and this is an off-diagonal matrix that basically describes my leakage between my orthogonal polarization channels. Although I assume my two um, orthogonal polarization channels, um, because they're orthogonal, to only uh, measure uh, the, uh, uh, the directions H and V, or horizontal and vertical, there are some leakage terms, and it's, uh, those are described here in the D matrix. And we follow that by uh, the complex gain correction. Now, it's worth noting, actually, that this G matrix is a catch-all. Um, and basically, we use it to describe most of our amplitude and phase effects that is introduced by our actual antenna electronics. So it's sort of a... Uh, per antenna catch-all gain and amplitude correction. Then we have our band pass. Now the band pass um, response describes the frequency dependence of the elect uh, antenna electronics which we have to correct for. And then we have our delay calibration. So this is our geometric and fractional delay errors that basically is corrected with fringe rotation which may set the position of the target, uh, which ensures that we set the position of the target into um, our phase center of our observations. So after we've defined this very long um, measurement equation describing absolutely everything that may happen to our signal, in practice, um, we focus we, you always you always focus on um, the fundamental three. So most common will be your gain, your band pass, and your delay. These you will always worry about. So let's focus on the on, on these three corrections. So using our observational data of representative calibrator sources, and this is where we, the, the calibrator sources come in, is to derive these corrections. The associated calibration solutions is computed as the relation between the observed and some known model or value. So remember, our we have some knowledge of our calibrator sources and we're going to exploit that to get a relation to these measured values that we can correct. So the calibration process, as we pointed out, will start with antenna-based calibration to correct for time and frequency independent effects. Okay. And during the calibration process, the respective antenna-based calibration solutions will be applied and the solution transferred, and after we're done, the solutions will be transferred to the science source before we will continue with our analysis. The fundamental to calibration will always be the need to correct for phases over time through gain calibration. The normalization of the band pass over pass band using band pass calibration, as well as the scaling of the arbitrary correlate accounts to fluxes, um, so our Jansky units through the flux calibration, which is why these uh, matrices are so important to us. Now, to get all these solutions, as we have repeatedly said so far, we need appropriate calibrators. Um, and to calculate the individual solutions, all calibrators must be either point sources or point-like or have known models. Um, and we prefer the point-like sources because remember from our, uh, our flagging um, presentation that point sources have a constant amplitude and a constant phase. It is a very, very useful characteristic 
that we exploit not only in flagging but also in, in calibration. Now the complex gains or phase calibration solutions um, to correct for the atmosphere and instrument. Remember G is this catch-all to, to correct for um, my instrumental effects. Uh, they generally require data from secondary calibrators. Um, they are point-like or have no models and they must be close to my science target. We'll get to a little bit more detailed discussion just now. Um, but the fact that they have to be close is very, very important um, because they need to estimate local conditions. So they are generally observed within 50 degree radius and they are observed um, in between my target, ob ob uh, my target observations as well. What is lucky as the, is that in most cases um, we find point-like radio sources scattered all around the sky. And I don't say point sources, but point-like, so compact enough sources. And in general we can find sources that are isolated enough so that they don't have too many confusing sources around them. What is not so common is my, flux, uh, is my primary calibrators. Now, these calibrators um, are much better known. They are well-known um, standard calibrators. And we use them to determine time-independent quantities such as my passband um, calibration. Now, passband calibrations, like for B, we do need sources where we have a known spectrum, and it has to be a known spectrum over a wide frequency range, especially for Meerkat, that have multiple feeds to cover a wide spectrum and as well as my flux calibrators, because I need the strong compact um, source with a known flux so I can scale my correlator counts to flux Jansky values for all my targets in my field. And then also to um, calculate my delay, uh, to, um, my, my K delay value, I need a flux, uh, a, a strong point source flux calibrator for the fractional delays. Uh, so when we apply these delays, you will actually see us um, applying them in order as well. So you will solve your calibration for each Jones matrix and you will start on the left and work your way to the right. You will start with your K or delay correction matrix, followed by solving for your B or band pass and lastly for your uh, G or gain. And as each uh, solution is calculated, Temporarily, that solution is actually applied to, your, uh, to the, uh, the observed data for your calibrator to sort of correct for the distortion before we actually calculate the next um, Jones matrix to describe the next uh, distortion um, calibration matrix. Now uh, we are using CASA and you will see that CASA, CASA's commands do these kind of temporary application or correction of calibration inherently in the commands and we'll point that out to you as we go along. Now as we've just mentioned um, we are using CASA but not only for CASA in standard the standard fast structure for radio astronomy data um, is going to be the um, measurement set or measurement uh, uh, measure, using the measurement equation, the measurement set, which is basically uh, a data, sort of a false structure, a false structure that has some database designed for keeping the various components, your data, your calibrator, uh, your calibration solutions, and those things in table structures. Um, and we are also, as we said, going to use the CASA software package for this tutorial, simply because it makes understanding the uh, um, the various commands and the various applications um, easy and quick to implement for everyone. The code snippets I'm going to show you is CASA and we're going to see them again in, in our tutorials. So first off, something I did not address in the, um, in the rhyme equation is actually the CASA step to uh, set the flux scale, which we call Sejansky. Now this is the first thing we generally do starting off our calibration routine um, and the reason we do this is simply to fill the model column of the measurement set for the calibrators. 
Um, so, and the reason we do this is um, in a couple of, of steps, you're going to see me use the gain calibration function, the gain cal, um, to correct for calibration over time variation and, and amplitude. But the thing is, the, this gain cal solution uh, assumes a point source um, and actually a one Jansky point source. So if I am using calibrators that are resolved, so calibrators that have models but are resolved, such as um, planets like Titan, which um, for certain frequencies um, is a standard flux calibrator, I don't actually want gain cal to calibrate out the phase and amplitude variation coming from the extension of my object. So this strategy of actually having model visibilities in the model column um, actually just prevents that from happening when um, gain cal uh, divides the data by the model, col uh, model column. So this is why we do the flux scale, but it's not explicitly mentioned. Now again, CASA makes this um, very easy for us. Um, which is why it's good to use in tutorials. And Sejansky has a number of models for planets and moons that you can actually um, also through plot MS display. Um, it also has a number of already existing model data for primary calibrators. And if it doesn't, and you do have a model and you do know the, uh, um, the Stokes parameters, it's also very easy actually to input this as a manual input into Sejansky uh, um, just by specifying your, your flux density models. So CASA makes this very easy for us. Then first up, after we have made sure that we um, calculate our models correctly, uh, next what we want to do is to actually uh, um, do a gain, uh, delay calibration and this is because our interferometer consists of a number of antennas whose output signals um, get correlated. And we know the maximum coherence will occur when all these signals are in sync, and thus all the signals must arrive from all the antennas onto the image plane at the same time. Um, and we know through the Fourier relation of the measurements that small delays on arrival between the antenna signals will cause phase errors in the correlated data. And in return, these small phase deviations um, will show up as time constant linear phase slope as a function of frequency in the correlated data of a single baseline. So if the frequency channel of an observation are averaged onto a continuum image, these uncorrelated delays will cause decorrelation in the continuum image. And it is thus important for us to actually um, correct these delays in the system to prevent reduction in the interferometer amplitude response and as a consequence um, reduce our image quality. So you know contributors to this problem so you know causes um, of these uh, delay errors will be um, atmosphere, different cable length, different path lengths, geometric delays as well as simply inaccuracies in the antenna position, timing errors, and those kind of things. Now, cable delays in the Meerkat telescope are compensated for by observing a bright calibrated target prior to the start of observations. Um, and these global um, delays are applied um, and used to align the data from the different antennas um, to the same timestamp. Okay, so technically we sync them before we start. But if you remember from yesterday, our observations um, are spread out over time. It takes a long time to fill in the UV space. So various effects such as just the daily temperature changes um, can actually cause uh, these measured delays to drift and for errors to occur in our observation. And these drifts in delays um, are relatively easy to calibrate out since the drift, uh, these drifts and errors are still small errors. What they will do is only cause this phase slope on any of our calibrators as a function of frequency. It's very easy to, to actually uh, measure um, and a small rotation um, to flatten this phase slope is all that's required to correct our delays. Um, 
And this is what the delay correction, um, the CASA gain K uh, matrix uh, solution actually give us. And, it so, and, and this solves um, the residual delay errors. We do use primary calibrator, so a flux or a band pass calibrator to solve for these steps. Um, and if you look at the, the actual the solution, so the K-table solution, you, expect, uh, you inspect them of, uh, after cal uh, calibration, uh, calculation. What you will want to see is only small nanosecond offsets. Um, so only nanosecond differences uh, between the per antenna per polarization in channels, uh, across all channels. Okay, so we want only nanosecond offsets for Meerkat. So next, we would want to look at the deviation um, of our amplitude and phase uh, response as a function of frequency, because our co uh, co uh, correlator will have some response, some ripple over frequency. And this is independent of the delay. Um, it, uh, it occurs inside in the instrumentation and it has to be corrected through band pass calibration, which is our B matrix. Now, since the band pass captures the frequency dependent sensitivity across the observed frequency range, uh, leaving the pass band uncorrected, so not correcting for uh, our pass band deviations, cause incorrect relative amplitudes and phases, and it does not deliver to us the correct spectral um, representation of the sky. So remember, we do spectral lines as well as imaging. And then, obviously, averaging these uh, incorrected impurities over frequency when we get to our continuum imaging will limit our achievable um, signal-to-noise or dynamic range, which is a weakness, weaker signal that we can detect. So applying the band pass calibration solution, the B um, solution, will correct for these complex gains as a function of frequency across the pass band. Um, and um, to achieve good results in both spectral line and continuum observation, the delay and band pass shapes have to be calibrated and we use primary calibrations. So you see here that for the band pass, I actually have two commands. And this is just going to be a suggested rule of thumb. You don't always need it. But um, what I said is the frequency, the, um, the frequency response is independent of time. But we are actually going to see some time instabilities. So the reason we do a gain cal beforehand is actually to stabilize the time varying components before we calculate the, bar, uh, the uh, band pass calibration solution across the spectrum. This gain cal is a throwaway, a throwaway calibration um, and we only use uh, a small selection of the band. So generally we use only a couple of channels that we know is R5 free and relatively flat. So it's a quick calibration. Okay. Um, and we apply this complex um, gain solution to our pass band. So we, both the delay and the stabilization com uh, complex gain over the time that we actually observe our calibrator to achieve the best SNR. Okay, this is going to give us the best SNR for our band pass calibration. Um, and you can actually check the, your band pass solution when you apply your band pass correction to the calibrator itself. Um, the data over a frequency should be fairly flat. Um, and that means that you have now basically normalized out all your frequency variations. So everything else, so after our delay calibration and after our um, band pass calibration, everything else that is remaining is very definitely going to be antenna based and lead to amplitude and phase changes that is going to be often time dependent. So now we're moving in time, so it's going to change over time during my observation. Now our antenna gain calibration, this is the matrix that we use to actually track these time varying um, distortions. And it, these are mainly due to changing conditions in the atmosphere and instrument. As I said, the observations um, takes a long time. So the largest contributor to these kind of time um, 
deviations are going to be you know, weather, cloudy days, um, the atmosphere, shadowing between antennas. So if we go to um, lower elevation, um, the back of the one antenna is going to reflect some um, uh, some, uh, some radiation onto the antenna um, close by it and it's going to be, that's what we call shadowing, it's going to pick up additional um, energy uh, due to observing geometry. Then we also have some occasional phenomena like solar flares. We have these pesky satellites of ours to our cell phones and even digital cameras that come and go. So as we saw in, in, in flagging, some of these um, we can't actually calibrate out like the RFI, the satellites and those things. They just distort the signal to a point beyond recovery. So we flag them out. For the rest, so if the satellite interference is not too bad, we're not into the non-linear region, we're still linear, we can still do something about it. And in those cases, we're going to use this gain calibration um, to basically correct or to um, uh, try to, to recover uh, the, the, uh, the true signal response. So um, on a practical level, what we should note is while the delay and bandpass, as we said, uh, are use primary calibrators, um, and the reason for that is they are slow varying in time. They are more frequency based than time based, so they are slow varying. So we use the primary calibrators for those. These gain uh, calibration, uh, calibrations, which is very definitely time based to track the local conditions. For these, we um, need to do more, um, more frequent uh, observations, more frequent corrections. And we also need the calibrator to be closer to the science target. I mean, one of the contributors, as I pointed out, is our atmosphere. So we do actually need this calibrator to be close to the target. So I do get a true reflection of the atmosphere towards my target when I do my solution on my gain calibrator. And as I said, the observations of this um, face calibrator will be interspersed with the target observation um, within a 15 degree radius of each other for my local conditions. Uh, as we pointed out earlier, a direct consequence of this requirement of close by may be that our secondary calibrators may not be as tight a point source as we can assume under our primary calibrators. They may be partially resolved or they may be resolved and we're going to use a model for them. Um, but we need them to be close by. So uh, you may see in calibration that you first have to calibrate your phase calibrator to derive a model before you can use it actually as a gain calibrator to calibrate your target. So after I have corrected for my frequency um, distortions as well as my um, time variations, um, the next thing I need to do is now say, okay, so I have these arbitrary um, correlator, well, it's not arbitrary, but correlator counts. So I have these correlator measured visibilities. How does this relate actually to the flux Jansky of my source, my real science amplitude? So to calibrate the target flux density, uh, we know that the um, visibility amplitudes for our uh, flux calibrator point source are proportional to the source intensity. And this means that the observed visibility of the calibrator with a known flux density can be rescaled, and it is done during this flux calibration st uh, stage, to ob uh, obtain the true flux density um, of all the targets um, at any of the observation frequencies. So the flux density scale adopted by Meerkat is actually based on Perley and Butler standard and it does provide us a, a range of flux densities for a number of sources and that will range between 1 and 50 gigahertz so that it covers all our observation, uh, our entire wide observation frequency range. So again here CASA makes it easy, it has for us this flux scale task that actually performs the bootstrapping and the calculation to derive the scale factors or scale models that we need um, for the correlator to Jansky conversion. And when we apply this to our target source, what we obtain, or basically to our target, uh, to, to our observed data, what we obtain is not only the flux Jansky of our calibrators, 
but this scale factor is actually um, for the entire sky and we obtain the flux density for all the targets um, in our observed data. So now we are done calibrating and we would like to apply all these calibration solutions to our science target that we can uh, actually continue on with, uh, um, calibr uh, with uh, um, our data analysis. You know, we're now done with all of this. But before we get there, often it is a very, very good idea to, to look at the calibrators themselves again to verify how well we did actually achieve our calibration solution. So before we apply calibration, let's verify that, in, that indeed everything has truly proceeded as well as we would like and uh, um, that our calibration solutions will actually give us good data for analysis. And again here we simply view the data using PlotMS, but this time what we do is we take our calibration solutions and we apply directly to our calibrators first. Um, something that's very useful to view is to check the goodness of the calibration um, is plot your corrected amplitude versus your corrected phase for a primary calibrator. Um, so corrected amplitude versus corrected phase for primary. Primary is a point source. Okay, And if I have a point source, a calibrated point source, what I would expect to see is a tight little ball okay, with the same angular size. So title, that's for point source, which is why I'm going to use my primaries. Also very useful for inspection is corrected amplitude versus baseline, which should be a flat line for a point source. Remember, it's going to be stable. Um, and if it is not, so the same would go here for the corrected amplitude versus UV distance. So if I do not have this flat line, that may actually be an indication to me that there is still some lingering antenna-based problems that I need to go back to and reflag um, in, in my original raw data. So please just note when you are actually looking at the um, corrected amplitude versus UV distance. Only for my calibrators, these will be a point source, um, for my point source, uh, point-like calibrators. If I have structure in my source, both my calibrator source and my science source, this will actually not be a flat line. Okay, so structure will start to show up. So please be careful when you use this evaluate, uh, evaluation that you do actually use a point source, but it is very, very useful. So one advantage of actually having the antenna-based calibration solutions is that you can actually use them, these solutions, and you can obtain them even if you don't have all the baselines. Okay, so they're generally very robust, they're easy to calculate, and you can then apply them to your target, uh, to your target um, observation data to get calibrated data. But one of the big disadvantages that we continue to see, uh, that we've seen throughout this presentation, is that our calibrators are observed at different times. So they're observed intermittently throughout the observation of our target. And they're also located at a different position on the sky than our target. Okay, so there we try to choose them well spaced and well positioned so that we can actually apply these solutions. They're still not the same direction, they're still not the same time. So quite often what we find is after we have transferred these calibration solutions onto our science target, there may still be some residual errors in the data. So to correct for these, we use a, a technique called self-calibration. Self-calibration helps to correct for residual amplitude and phase errors, um, as well as some direction-dependent effects. Now, Ben will explain self-calibration to you in much more detail um, in following presentations, but the basic algorithm, just to keep in mind, will be that you calculate your antenna-based standard calibration solutions, you apply them to your um, target, and you make your first image. And using this image target, you can then derive a model, and you use this actual model to calibrate your data again, okay, um, using some solution interval. You then reapply these obtained self-calibration solutions, make a new image of your target, from which you get a new model 
and you continue to do this calibration re-imaging for model stage um, until you no longer see an improvement in your signal to noise in your SNR and in general we find through applying this self calibration um, step we do actually improve the RMS noise of our final images. So just in summary um, we see that there are many effect, effects, including the atmosphere, delay errors, and um, our beloved electronics um, in our receiver system that works to corrupt our signal from our science target. Now, since our science goals will be affected if the observation data cannot be properly calibrated, um, we do actually put in a lot of effort in um, standard and more uh, modern calibration um, techniques to acquire uh, calibration solutions, which we then um, transfer onto, the, uh, um, onto our target. But a fundamental is the standard calibration techniques. Yes, we do assume bright and simple sources, but we, ha we do find that they actually do um, correct uh, and eliminate most of our instrumental and time-independent effects. Uh, a very useful tool to us is our um, RIME, our measurement equation. Um, we use it as a, a framework to understand the errors and the distortions and also to determine our calibration um, parameters. So our additional techniques, stronger techniques, once we have these basic calibrations to actually improve and achieve a larger, strive for larger dynamic um, range in our imaging, is through methods like self-calibration, um, which we apply to remove direction-dependent um, effects, which can't be corrected through a standard uh, antenna-based calibration, as well as residual errors, due to the fact that we are using different targets in our antenna calibration methods. Um, and these actually do improve and provide us with sufficient signal-to-noise ratio, um, but the one thing we have to keep in mind is to actually be able to do self-calibration. We do actually have to be have to have sufficient baselines in order to achieve accurate models of our source. Um, so if you are unsure, so just in the beginning as you're starting to get accustomed to this, um, most telescopes actually do have staff astronomers. I mean, I can, you know, we, we have our astronomers and, and they do actually know this telescope, they work with the Mirka data. Um, and they are very well familiar with the Mirka data, the distortions, as well as how well the calibration routines will perform and what calibration routines is actually, um, you know, viable for the data. And they try to assist people the, um, through the progress of Meerkat evolution and development um, in describing Meerkat data processing techniques. So it will be well worth your while that when you are working towards observing Meerkat, starting to um, do Meerkat observations or looking at Meerkat data, is to just go through the astronomers' user documentation on calibration strategies, which they are very, uh, which they very helpfully published um, to to the web through the Sorrow Service Desk. So just go onto the Soro service desk, they are actually um, on there, try to give you some ideas, some recipes that they have found through experience to work well with Miyaka data.